so welcome um, to our series. Um, uh, today, uh, after a lovely lunch prepared by Cécile Chasson, it was delicious. Oh, very good. Always very delicious. Good. Um, we're going to talk about uh, ghost stories and mysterious tales. But before we do that, I wonder if we might just quickly introduce ourselves. I'm Diana Coast sampson I was born and raised in Ayrshire. I'm married 58 years to my husband, Emma Day. We have three beautiful children and three beautiful grandchildren. I worked to 27 years for Canada Post. I retired 18 years ago. And uh, I walk every day. <laughs> I try, see you. And I keep, I keep as busy as possible. And yeah, I do lots of volunteer work of my whole life. You know? So yeah, I try to stay healthy and walk with my friends. All right. We go tea parties, stuff like that. Well, welcome. Thank you. I'm Jean Joyce Stone. I was born and raised in Descous. I have three children and I have six grandchildren. <laughs> We're sure no. I'm sure no. <laughs> and you, you have a collection of stories of mysterious. I do. Happenings. I have the book Mysterious on the Dam. Right. One of the books I've written. Yes. Lots of stories in there. <laughs> yeah. I'm Jeanette Terrien. Uh, people call me Jin. Originally from Quebec, uh, I was kidnapped at a very young age by my parents and taken to Ontario. I escaped when I was 50 <laughs> and uh, landed in uh, Erishat in 07. Um, I love the place. I, I feel like I've died and got to heaven. And yes, I'm going to heaven for your inquiry there. Yes, I, I'm, po I'm positive I'm going to heaven. Um, I've met some fantastic people. Um, I'm not a very social person, like I don't, uh, I don't go around visiting, but uh, I'm friendly enough, I'm approachable, so I don't bite. <laughs> I've written three books, uh, my third one is going to come out any time now, um, so we're just going to wait and see, and I'm happier than pig and poop being uh -huh. in this area, and I don't plan on going anywhere unless I'm dead. All right. I'm Gabriel Leblanc. <coughs> I was born in Petit de Gras, and um, from there I uh, had my early education there. Convent in Erechat, St. FX, Dalhousie. Then I went into teaching, spent 40 years in education. And after that, I've uh, written three books one of the history of El Madame, the oral tradition of El Madame, and the remedies of El Madame. Um, um, and a fourth one, uh, the characters of El Madame. Mm. And uh, I might finish it, <coughs> or I might not. It depends <laughs> how fast you want to go. Right? Well, then we might read it, or we might not. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but uh, no, uh, I enjoy, I like El <coughs> Madame. I, uh, I like to travel, but uh, I like to come back. Mm. And their uh, Aunt Madame is made up of wonderful people, and uh, I am close to a lot of them, and uh, they're all my relatives anyway. Exactly. <laughs> if we're all related. Deep enough in the family tree, I don't know. <laughs> we're all related. Oh yes. She calls herself a Joyce, but she's actually a Joss. Joss. Yes. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. so, a Joss from way back, but uh, Joss is not Acadian. Uh, it's French uh, from uh, French. Uh, military. Yeah, yeah. French. Yeah. 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 Well, I was surprised. Welcome. Thank welcome. you. I don't, I'm not really sure how to start off. I mean, uh, you tantalized us over lunch with, a, with the suggestion that you had a story that was life-shattering. It was, it was, it's mysterious, not life-shattering, but to this <coughs> day I cannot make sense of it whatsoever. You want to tell us what it is? Oh, sure. I've been told that I drive like a maniac <laughs> and that I'm a speed demon or whatever. And I was speeding, you know, down uh, the road in Ontario, uh, past the Brock University and, you know, like I, I had a good clip. And out of nowhere, I hit an emu or an ostrich. It was a bird with a long neck and I saw it, I saw it hit. The head went and hit uh, my, my hood and... I, for me to hit uh, an animal, I mean, I'd rather hit a human than an animal, and I, I mean that lovingly, of course. And uh, anyways, I got out of the car, I stopped the car, got out of the car, there was nothing. Hmm. 
<laughs> not a dent, not a feather, nothing, no bird, nothing. That's nothing. Blur. Yeah, and I swear on my own life that I hit a bird, a big bird, wow. either an emu or an ostrich. And what they were doing there near Brock University, I'll never know. But there was nothing, not even a dent, a feather, nothing. Well, that's a mystery, all right. Yeah. Another yeah. dimension. Yeah, Another dimension, uh, maybe. weird. Mm -hmm. There was uh, there was a time uh, I know certainly on this island um, where people regularly encountered mysterious things. There's all kinds of stories about those. Saint Anne Hospital, for one. So tell me, tell us about it. Well, <clears throat> there used to be uh, a nun that you'd hear her coming, but she never appeared. That I heard myself, because I worked at St. Anne's as well. They, uh, that's when I first went to work. As I was only 15 then. And we used to live upstairs, you know, at the, the third floor of St. You know, the old mm -hmm. hospital. Yes, yeah. yes. The Bishop's Palace. It was the Bishop's Palace. My mother-in-law was raised there by the priest. And uh, so there's the, there was always that story. And then... Uh, so this was a ghost that inhabited... This was that? a ghost, a nun who inhabited uh, St. Mm -hmm. Anne's. But when I worked there... You know Gus Bouchard, you know the Bouchard family, mm -hmm. Robert Bouchard, that, that family. Mm -hmm. Well, he had a younger brother, Gus, who died at St. Anne's. He was only 15 years old. He died of a heart. He had heart failure, mm -hmm. I think it was, yeah. And when I was working there, I used to work a lot of nights because my husband, well, my boyfriend at the time, he was away in Quebec. He was in the military. So I used to work a lot of nights. And I, at night, we'd hear the, the buzzer ringing, like a little bell. Everybody had like a little bell or something. We'd go upstairs. Everybody was sound asleep. And I told this to my husband one night when we were talking on the phone, and I said, we keep getting this buzzer, and there's nobody there when we go up. And he said, oh, that's just Gus playing tricks on you. He knows you're my girlfriend. And I said, you think it's Gus? And he said, yeah, I think it's Gus. Next time, tell him to stop. So the next time it happened, we went upstairs, went twice. And I said, okay, Gus, if that's you, no more. I'm getting tired of coming up these stairs. Johnny said for you to stop. And we never heard no more buzzers that night. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. It was Gus. It, it was, was Gus. Gus. <laughs> I don't you know. must have heard stories <laughs> growing um, up. Yeah. We, uh, I was raised in Cape Ogwit, mm. a small little village. There's only a few houses left now. But I was actually born there uh, in my grandfather's house. And uh, when we were children growing up, we always uh, listened to these horror, like, you know, ghost stories. The older folks would gather around in the wintertime, and we used to be shooed off the bed. But when we were upstairs, they used to have a big hole in the middle of the floor so that the, the heat could rise. Oh, yes. And so we'd sneak over, to, and so we'd listen to all the stories. And then <laughs> after that, we were scared to go to bed. <laughs> but one of the stories they used to say was during mackerel uh, season, there was always, they used to call it in French, le, le plein du macro. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, <clears throat> they used to say that it had, it, the, the story began that they had, uh, there was a, a colored person that lived in the village. Whatever happened, it was assumed that he had been murdered hmm. during the, the macro season. So during the macro season, they always heard this lament. You know how these mm. the, the the black people used to have all these songs like and spirituals. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And uh, so I remember mom and dad used to talk about that all the time. And mom said after she was married, they never heard it down the head of the harbor because they were fishermen, they were farmers. But when she lived in Cape Ogwit, they were fisher people. So of course she said we used to hear it. It would be in that corner. So they'd take a shoe and they throw it in the corner, so it would stop. And then they would go to the next corner and it would do the same thing there. So they would throw a shoe there too. Wow! And it was in the house. It was in the house. It was in all the fishermen's houses in Cape Ogre. Huh? Each house wow. had a plenty mackerel. Wow! Yeah, and uh, we grew up with that. But it's funny, all those houses, <laughs> I don't think they hear that anymore. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> I, I have no idea. I haven't heard any reports. But it was, yeah, so we used to hear these, and the, the people, the men folk would gather around, and they'd say, they talk about the ship that they used to see out of, they, they, my father-in-law used to tell us all the time. We, I went out this morning fishing, and this big ship passed right by us. And I could hear them talking, and I could see them working, and I said, it's funny. Hmm. You know, we don't see that ship anymore, but it was there then. It was there then. Yeah, you yeah. must have heard a lot of these tales, yeah. Gabrielle. Yeah, we, uh, <clears throat> there was one in particular, 
Et vous quand la, la, la vieille Dico, quand Dico was, uh, la vieille Dico was born, and uh, as a young lady, she was very, very pretty, blonde, blue eyes, which was unusual in the Acadian community to have that. And uh, one night, she heard people next to her barn. They were packing boards, the sound of putting one board on top of the other all the time. So she went out and she looked around, nobody. The boards were there all packed. So she came back in the house and she heard it three times. <laughs> and she just couldn't figure out what transpired. The next day, the neighbor's three sons came to her place, seeing if they could borrow four planks they needed to wake her, their mother. Her mother had died during the night. And they say that from that fright that she got, from that, that she she turned white overnight. <laughs> wow. Wow. I've heard people turning white yes, overnight. Yes, I have over, too. Over, out I've of heard fear. that, yeah. 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 I have. And there was uh, also the, the revenant. The revenant is uh, when somebody dies and he's... He still has work to do, or nothing that was settled, yes. and he's coming back to settle the score. Yes. We've heard many of those stories ah. from uh, my grandfather. Yeah. Hmm. And uh, some of them, uh, of course, being Acadians down in Pere de Grau, never would you hit, uh, you know, the, the, the media, the English medias or anything like that, unless you shot somebody. Yes. You know, and that was a, a rarity. A uh, race. Yeah. So anyway, uh, my grandfather used to tell us the story about Le Grand Chaffray de 32. Uh, Chaffray comes from the word chaviré, turned the community right over. And it was about uh, a young uh, bride that was killed by a ram, a sheep, you know, a male sheep. And he goes on for about half an hour telling you this story. And uh, of course, uh, w what happened is that this uh, uh, Joe Eleka Joe was a young boy who uh, was the only member of his family and he, uh, when he went to school he only had, had, could go to school till 12 years old because his father became was victim of uh, drowning and so he was the one that had to take care of the mother uh, so he put his personal life aside and he took care of his mother for over 60 years and, uh, That's been known to be done for sure. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, <clears throat> one day he decided to, uh, he was lonely, his mother had died, she had just passed away, and he was living in the, one of the Lens uh, uh, Moyac in Cape Hogan. That's where he was living. And he had uh, a little house there, and, and the only thing that was uh, Amusing him at night was the tick-tock of that big clock he had in the living room and of course the shadows that the, the kerosene lamp used to project on the, on the walls. Eh? So he decided that he was going to go and visit. So uh, when he went to school he had become fond with uh, Marie-Angelique which was a girl because he was so small him she, she took him under her wing and protected him uh, at school hmm. and he still remembered that. So he decided to go visit her, and Marie Angelique had never married. She was an old spinster at the time. And when she seen him coming in to visit, uh, well, she was just like a little uh, a newborn cow, you know, that uh, in the barn you let out the first in the spring. She was jumping up <laughs> all over the place. Eh? <laughs> so anyway, uh, the visits became more and more uh, frequent. And she he asked uh, he asked her to marry her. And she accepted. So anyway, they had to plan the wedding, and they couldn't get married during Advent because it was preparation for Christmas, and they couldn't get married in Lent. So they had to. They chose the last weekend, uh, last Monday before Lent, to marry. And of course, the first four months things were going very well, because they decided to stay at his house in Cape Ogden, and uh, she was putting her. Uh, prints in the house, you know, changing the color of the walls, new new blankets in the bed and all this stuff, you know, she was doing that. But the fourth month, things got to, started to get a little sour and uh, nothing that Joe could do would please her. 
So he said in order to keep peace in the house, he decided to concentrate his work on the outside and she would do the inside. <laughs> so the first nice day in May, he decided to let all the animals on his little farm out and uh, to eat the, the new grass that was there. And anyway, uh, he let them out. He let the, the 14 sheep and the, the ram was out, the cows, the, the ox, and of course his horse and the old works. <coughs> and uh, he decided it was a nice day, so he decided he was going to turn the garden over uh, to plant the early seeds. He wasn't in the garden five minutes as she was out against, you know, right by the chicken house. And she was pointing the finger at him telling him what direction to put the drills, how high they should be, and what to plant in. Of course, the ram was going around the house and he, he saw her, and he mirrored her, and he took off after her, and he came on to her like a freight train, and he cleaned her, and boom, and he hit, she hit against the, the chicken house and she died, killed her. And of course, in a small community in Medellin, I mean, that news went through like wildfire. Huh? So the, the, the ladies of the community, the car West, came in and they took her, they, they took the body and they, they cleaned her, prepared her for uh, the, the wakes while her coffin was being built. Huh? So they used to wake them on, on five, four planks and, uh, and a white, uh, what you would call uh, a tablecloth sometimes, or a bed sheet, sheet. Uh, they, would, they would put on. So anyway, the first, uh, of course, when everybody heard that, even they traveled to the next parish and the next parish, and even the English <coughs> journalists came down, the reporters, they wanted to find out the minute details of how this happened. Because after all, the Acadians of Pere de Gras had survived two deportations, they had survived the big flu of 1919, two wars, the Depression, uh, many drownings, but uh, a lady being killed by a ram, that is something that uh, none of the districts <laughs> in uh, the Acadian community had heard of, you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, they, they prepared her for the, for the wake that, uh, you know, that night, and of course the first one to arrive was the priest with Les Enfants Marie, you know, the, the, the children of Mary to just come and say the prayers of the dead that night and and after that well the general public could come in and poor little Joe was uh, there next to the body and he was uh, shaking hands with the uh, with the people that offered them sincere condolences and he was bowing there once in a while and some of that was shaking his head and the priest was in the corner of him and he was observing that and he couldn't figure out what was going on with Joe, you know. So after the wake, uh, the priest ap approached Joe and he said, you know, what's going on? He said, sometimes you're bending too. Oh, he said, yes, Father, he says, whenever somebody offers me their sincere condolences, I thank them from the bottom of my heart. But he said, how about that? He said, every man in the parish wants to buy my ram, but it's not for sale. <laughs> 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 so she wasn't ram tough as much. <laughs> but you, but uh, it was stories like that, and I mean, it's the yeah. details, and the details were there were so much details that if, and you couldn't deny the details, mm -hmm. and chances are you would swallow the story, mm -hmm. you know, because of the details. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. Well, and they paint a rich picture, right, of life. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, it, that's it, right. You grew up in a small town in Quebec. You must have had grown up with with stories people told back back in the day about small place yeah uh, this one uh, it's not spiritual in any way shape or form but uh, my mother had a cousin that you know had a weird sense of humor <laughs> and like you said they used to wake people on the dining room table right mm -hmm. well before the people came to pay their respects the two cousins tied fish wire to uh, the dead person and of course you couldn't see it like you know oil lamps oh and things like that so to make a long story short uh, the dead person you know sat up in the middle of everybody and greeted <laughs> oh right? and waving and everything else so the wake didn't last very long they just went gone <laughs>
So that's the kind of sense of humor that, you know, that's in my family. Kind yeah. Of thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, cemeteries and things like that really, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think I inherited that because I, I love cemeteries and I used to drive a hearse just for the fun of it. And, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, jokes like that. Yeah. Well, there's a, there was, um, I mean, I remember growing up, uh, the old people in our family always had a very dark sense of humor, right? I mean, they, they told, you know, stories about terrible times that they had gone through. You know, I, I remember stories about when the flu hit this area and, and some of the experiences that people had. But they also had a, a terrifically dark sense of humor at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, um, I mean, my my father. I mean, my father. I think growing up in that tradition, loved to tell the story about he he would stay with a couple of elderly aunts in the summers. Um, and again, this is more along the line of humor than a ghost story or mysterious stories happening. But the old ladies would tell terrible tales at night, you know, mysterious and awful happenings, and and scare themselves half to death. And so my father <laughs> would lie in wait under the bed on occasion. And when the old girls would sit on the bed to take their stockings mm. off, he'd reach out and grab their ankles. Mm. <laughs> I did that to my husband once. <laughs> it works. <laughs> well, I think the results could be quite dramatic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know he could dance, but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, my father would only do this when the, when the old ladies were telling ghost stories. Yeah. The stage was set. <laughs> Um, who, what's the name of the mysterious creature that was supposed to live, uh, over at Cape Ogat, the Fufale? Fufale. Fufale, yeah. Fireball. Fireball. Fireball, yeah. Fufale. Yeah. So a lot of people don't know about, uh, the Fufale. They disappeared once the electricity came to the, to the island. Right. Yeah. Well, when you cross the barrens, like one of, the, in my mistress, mysterious Amadam, I have the story about, uh, Dans les Bois. Okay. Into the woods. And it's a story about uh, this Melanie. Her, you know, she was a young girl. Her name was Melanie. And they had come across to the parish. They had gone to confession, her and a group of friends. But the group of friends decided they wanted to go to the dance at the old courthouse. Back then there were dances there. And, but, but she wasn't allowed to go. Her, her, she had a very strict mother. She didn't want her to meet boys because she was afraid she was going to lose her. There was just the two of them. So the young boy... Rode, the, rode her across the harbor. She got out there and it was still daylight. He said, are you gonna be all right? And she said, oh yeah, she said, I'll be fine. But as she was crossing the barrens, the old Acadians, they called it the barrens and it was, it was not a place you did not cross at night because of the fafalay. Okay. So anyway, you always carried a needle on you. If you, if, when you crossed the barrens or when you were gonna be L in the like woods. Like a sewing needle. Like a, like a, <coughs> like a needle, a sewing needle. And then you also had to have a pure heart. So they wouldn't bother you. So anyway, she's crossing the barrens and she's noticing in the distance, she sees some, some fireballs, the balls are and they're coming together and she knows that when they come together, they're gonna to come after her. So she, she was looking for her needle and she can't find it. Somehow she lost it. So she knew that she wasn't gonna make it to the other end. So she, she's running as fast as she can. And, and then she, she looks behind and the fireballs are coming after her and she, then she thinks she, she's going to go to the, you know, the big white crosses they used to have back in those days? She knew she'd be safe there at the white cross. There was one in Cape Olgat. But because her, her family lived on the other side, you know where the uh, lobster plant is now? Mm -hmm. She lived on that side because there were guy ashes back there. People lived there back then. Anyway, that's where she had to get to. So anyway, she knew she wasn't going to make it. it. It was too far away, and she wasn't going to be able to cross over the white fence. And she turned around, and she, she said, I did not make a complete confession. She said, I, I went to fetch, fetch my cow, and my boyfriend was there, and he kissed me, and I didn't, tell the, I didn't confess it. And the fireball just came at her and burst into a million pieces because she had now had the clean soul where she didn't before she had made a complete confession. <laughs> and she knew the fireball was going to get her but she hadn't made a complete confession. So the next morning, she, when everybody went to the, where the cross was, there was a black mark where the, where the fillet had burst into flames. Huh? And no matter how many times they painted it, it would always turn black mm -hmm. over the years. 
So that was Melanie. Yeah. La Belle Melanie. La Belle yeah. Melanie. La Belle Melanie. Did you, you must have grown up with stories of, about... Yeah. Uh, well, uh, one story, when she's talking about La Fifala, we used to hear, hear about La Fifala a lot. And then uh, uh, my parents and my grandparents used to talk about uh, leprechauns. Okay. There were leprechauns. The little people. Little people yes. in Cape Pocket. The lutin. The lutin. The lutin. The lutin. And uh, <coughs> mom used to tell us all, always this story, that she had gone to the barn. She was going to go and milk the cows. And when she gets there, the horse is all in a sweat. And it's all braided. The mane and the, the tail is all braided. Small, tiny little braids. Full of braids. Full of braids. And uh, she said, yeah, at night, she says, the lutin, they come to the barn, and they take the horses out, and they do their work with our horses. Huh. And when they come back, our horses, they were, she said, you, you literally have to brush them all down because they'd be drenched. And she huh. said, but they had all these little braids in their mane. And that's how the, the, the story of the lutins came about. Hmm. So we were brought up thinking that they were behind every little rock and Cape Oak there was a lutin. <laughs> you know, and it was strange because I have a, a, a great uncle who was actually a little person. His name was Frankie, Uncle Frankie. He was a wonderful little person. But because he was small, we kind of associated him with the lutin. Mm. Yes. <laughs> right. Because he was small, but he was just a he wasn't a midget. He was just a, a small person. Just a small person. He was a small yeah. person. Because... And the rest of his brothers were giants, <laughs> like my dad and all his family. They're all six, taller than six three, six four, and he was the smallest. Mm. Of, he was the youngest and the smallest. But yeah, so they talked about Le Lutin a lot. So were these stories? Um, I mean, they, were these stories told further afield than Cape Oget, or, or uh, like, uh, did, did sure. every community have? I, I think every that? community had yeah, their I, own, I, I yeah. they, they only <clears throat> had, they had their own, you know, their own versions of whatever. Yeah. Right. But I was born and raised in Cape Oget, so a lot of the stories yes. came from the older folks, you know, yeah. a lot of the, uh, yeah. My grandfather used to be invited to wakes, weddings, as an entertainer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because he was good, he was a raconteur, he was good at, at telling I'm stories. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. And I mean, were they true? Were it, they were true in the sense that he told them. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, yeah. that, that's about it. My father I was yeah. a great storyteller, yeah. John, old John Stone. Yeah. He told me the story about um, the ships that used to come along the coast and that the people in some parts of Almadem, I don't say where, <laughs> but some parts of Almadem would make a bonfire on the shores. And the ships would think that was the lighthouse. And so they would mm -hmm. come, they would run aground. And the next day, of course, the townspeople would help them with the, get off the, the shoal. And that by, by doing that, the ship owner, the captain, would give them food. And it would last them for a while. And so they, they used to keep doing this. But this one time that they did it, something went wrong. The, either the waters were too rough or whatever, but... The ship went down, and all the people, all the men on board went down with the ship. Mm. They all died. And on a clear night, on the anniversary of that, if you listen closely, you will hear the sounds of the men howling mm. and crying because they're drowning in the water. Mm. My yeah. father-in-law told me that story. And there's yeah. stories, too, in Cape Hogan. Yeah. There's a, a ship that went aground there, but it was a rum runner. Mm. And uh, they picked up... Uh, Barrels of rum and bottles, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was some there. Well, happy years. day on yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I heard that one all the way through Lewisburg. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's one of the stories I heard in Lewisburg. Yeah. Yeah. Some lot. of these stories do, you do hear different versions of them in different communities. Yes. Yeah. Bernice Boudreaux wrote a book um, a couple of years ago, stories you know that she collected in the 90s from people. And on more than one occasion, I hope I get this right, and, and you'll correct me if you know the story and I'm wrong, but... There were a couple of people in it, she and her, you talked about um, a snake with, or yeah, a snake with kind of ruby eyes, often connected with treasures. Does this ring a bell oh. to anybody? Oh, okay, no. well maybe this was oh. a story that was. I heard told. about a, a dog. Okay. With with the the red eyes that would follow, like if you're uh, supposedly uh, uh, there was a, a a guy, a young man that he wanted to go. Just to visit a girl or something, yeah. and his mom 
told him, I know who it is. Yeah, <laughs> don't want you to go. You're not allowed to go there. Yeah. But as he was driving, because there weren't that many vehicles in that day, mm. so as he was driving, this dog with the big red eyes was following him until he got to the crossing in Cape Ogut where there's a fork. You go down to where the boat club is at and go towards Cape Ogut. And when he got there, the, the, the dog supposedly did the sign of the cross and he left, he went on his way and the dog didn't follow him any further. Hmm. Uh, this is the story. I right. Yeah, yeah, Joe was... Davy tells the story about the black dog. Oh, yeah. And he had... that, when he wanted to go out, his father told him, uh, you go out, he said, the devil could get you. Anyway, he went out and this black dog was following him, very similar to what mm. you're talking about. And when he got back home, he told his father, he said, he said, uh, you told me I was going to see the devil. Well, I saw the devil tonight. Huh? I, I got you beat. I got you beat. I okay. got you beat. <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. The name Corriveau comes from France. Okay. And the person who brought the name to Canada is an ancestor of, of ours. My mother's maiden name was Corriveau. So all Corriveaux are related because of that one person. Mm -hmm. You lived in Quebec, you said. Did mm -hmm. you ever hear La Corriveau? No? I wasn't there very long, only six months. I lived there right in Quebec City. If you Google the name La Corriveau, La Corriveau, La Corriveau it's a folk tale, but there's truth to it. She was tried, she was tried as the Black Widow, accused of killing three husbands. Holy smokes. Yeah. And when uh, she lost the trial, which was totally unfair, the story is told. They've made movies of it, they've written books about it, uh, and everything. It sounds familiar. And anyways, after they, she was condemned to, to be hanged until she died, then they put her body in a cage. And they hung the cage in Lévis, at, at the crossing when you go to Lévis, or the cage hung there yes. with her dead body. And the, the people say now that, you know, like you pass there and she'll chase you. You know, oh, like wow. the, her spirit has her spirit never left the area. There. Yeah. Mm. Back in the 1980s or 1990s, they found her cage buried in um, Salem, and they brought it back to Quebec. It's now in the museum in Quebec. It so was that, in Salem. That part of the story is true. How wow. did that cage end up in Salem? It was. They stole it. They stole her body. Her body had, had stayed there for weeks, and the rot was unreal, yeah. like I the stench imagine. and you know everything else. And uh, one night, wow. somebody stole uh, the wow. cage and the body, I think, wow. or if I remember right, or the, maybe she was buried with the cage, I don't know. But the cage was uh, unturred in, uh, in Salem hmm. and brought back wow. to Quebec, and it's at the museum in Quebec. So La Corriveau, wow. it's really interesting. Really interesting, yeah. I, I sort of remember the last time I was in Quebec City. Uh, there's a lot of mysterious a and lot ghost of stories and yeah. associated with various buildings and stuff there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, but La Corriveau, my, La my great, 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 great ancestor. That yeah. was her. How do you spell yeah. Corriveau? Uh, C-O-R-R-I-V-E-U. V-A-U. V-E-A-U. C-O-R-R-I-V-E-A-U. Corriveau. And there's different spellings of it, but the, the, the Corriveau, uh, no matter how you spell it, she's, her family, her, her father was the one that came to Canada. Yeah. In right. the 1600s, the, the, the name Corriveau, wow. yeah. yeah. Did, did, were, was she ever married? Well, yeah, she was married, of course. Three she times. Three husbands. But children, did she have children? Not that I know of. Oh, okay, so she has no descendants. And uh, in the story, they say that, uh, like, her, her father's the one that gave her up. But oh. the one that uh, they believe killed the, the husband, her husband, was the father. But he gave her up. She was not even allowed to talk at her own trial. Oh, wow. And she was tried by the that's the British that owned Quebec at that time, mm -hmm. and they wanted to make an example of her. Right. So after the, they died, they made a cage and put her in it. Wow. So this would have been in the 1760s? Late 1600s, maybe 17, uh, I don't remember the dates, yeah. but uh, she's very well documented. Mm -hmm. Just yes. Google her. Yeah. 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 Well, some of these tales do spread far and wide. I mean, there's a story about a, a ghost ship that... Uh, I mean, several ghost ships, mm -hmm. but there's a very famous one, right, that goes up and down. Not, not the Street. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and so what are the details of that, Gabrielle? Do you, like... Well, it, apparently it was, it was carrying a lot of Irish uh, 
people from Ireland after the potato famine mm. who was headed to Quebec. And people d don't know how the, that ship ended up in Northumberland Strait because you have to go quite a higher to get into the mouth of the St. Lawrence to go there to, into Quebec. But that's apparently what it, what it was, and uh, it caught fire for some right. unusual f feeling, and it went down. Yeah, but people claim to still see it yes. uh, yeah. on yeah. fire in the street. Yeah. Really? When? Yeah. Like, what time of year? Like any, It can be any time, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, is my recollection. I mean... Yeah. Uh, because there's a... There, there's a Quite a few Irish descendants living in Quebec, and uh, the yeah. reason is that Quebec took them in uh, after the potato famine, and they had an island just outside Quebec City where they had them in quarantine, and they have a big uh, uh, Irish cemetery there where a lot of them, well, they were half dead when they got aboard the boat, and then coming across, a lot of them didn't make it. Mm -hmm. And then they had to be quarantined to make sure that they had no diseases before they were allowed to come in. Uh, to Quebec, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but uh, oh, there, there's lots of stories, and it's the same thing as the story of the black dog in uh, in West Ayrshire. One thing that you weren't allowed to talk about is the church and the priests. Never say anything negative about it, because uh, there was a person. There was a person there in uh, in uh, Bastien uh, from uh, West Ayrshire. He used to work uh, seven days a week, and it wasn't allowed by the church. After all, Sunday was the day of rest. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the Lord had made the earth and on, and the seventh day he rested, and they had to follow suit on that. But he worked, and he used to make fun of those that were going to church. And was there, you know, he said, "Me fou, you know, we are at the église, but he said, 'C'est pas l'église qui va vous donner à manger dans le mois de mars.'" <laughs> and anyway, he was, uh, and of course, uh, what happens is one day the, he went missing, that fellow. And they couldn't figure out where he went. So the, the, the couple of the boys from Westershed went into his house and they looked and his bed was made and everything and he was nowhere to be seen. So they decided to follow the shore. Maybe he, he drowned or something or do his work. But uh, the neighbors observed that every around four o'clock, just before the dark, a black dog would come out of the woods and walk all around his property and go back in the woods. And they couldn't figure out, you know, what, what was happening. And again, a couple of the braver fellows from Assertia decided that they were going to follow that dog in. So they did. And they, as they went into the woods, and the dog was ahead of them, the the footprints of the dog changed into a bigger print hmm? of a man. And the bigger the bigger print, <laughs> was a that, uh, the, that of a wolf. Whoa! Uh, a wolf. Yeah. And then they they, uh, they they were they told us, you know, that never to travel alone at night in Western mm -hmm. Shed. Because chances are you could be attacked by the Lugaru. Mm. <laughs> and it was a man that was changed change to a black dog that changed into, into a wolf. wolf. That's really That's scary. A werewolf. <laughs> a werewolf. Well, it was there, said, uh, too, that they talked about uh, that big uh, burgundy house uh, across from uh, or the church. Yes, yes. They, had, yeah. they talked because the, the monks lived there. Mm -hmm. hmm. And uh, they still, apparently, up to maybe about uh, 20 years ago, they could still hear them praying up in the third story. Are you talking about the LeBlanc house? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, I've heard yeah. stories about there that There were monks wow. that lived up yeah. there. Fiddle players in there, too. Yeah. Goodness yeah. gracious. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> fiddle player. Yeah, yeah. Plays the fiddle. There's an yeah. active life of spooky yeah. beings in this well, island. Well, the, yeah, <laughs> it was very entertaining as a child growing yeah. up. I mean, you know, we'd be scared to death to go to bed. Yeah. But, I mean, you could listen to these stories all night long. And yeah. they, they, they were, they believed them. Yeah. Whatever they said, they never, like, they said the same story every night. Mm -hmm. But they never ever wavered from the the storyline itself. Right. They always had the same words. It I was might, like you know you you ask a yeah. child something, and if it's the truth, they're going to tell you they're the same way. Same, same consistent. Way. So yeah. It, yeah. the same the the next night or the night after, if they said the story, it was exact 
But you know, there was no entertainment. They had mm -hmm. no TV, they had right. no radio, mm -hmm. except to listen to the news, and that was on a battery. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, yeah. and, uh, you know, and as a kid, you were always outside. Dad yeah. used to talk about... You know, la famille, si oh, yeah. <laughs> Dad used to talk about, uh, you know, when they, they, were fisher, they were fishermen, so he said, you take your boat, and he said, uh, the elderly ladies would come down, they all wore these long dresses at that time, he That's said, right. you know. And as little boys, well, guess what they would do? They would be underneath the wharf, and they'd be looking. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Yeah. Well, a lot, a lot of the stories that were told back then was to keep the uh, kids in line, like yes, you scared the sure. shit out of them, right? Yeah, yeah, just right. to keep them in line, just kind keep, of thing. Yeah. Right. But I, and I think a lot of it too, though, was pure entertainment. I mean, I when we used to visit here in the summers. Um, and, and Jen will remember, and my Uncle Ralph was a man of very mm -hmm. few words, my yes, great Uncle Ralph, was, yes. Yes. he didn't say much. Yeah. But the old ladies were terrified of th thunder and lightning storms. Mm -hmm. and so if we stayed in that house on the lower road and there was a storm, particularly my grandmother, she really was very nervous about thunder and lightning, they'd wake us up. And when we were very small, they'd take us down to the kitchen that was in the basement. My mother did it. And then Uncle Ralph would tell the most terrifying <laughs> stories. <laughs> so if they'd left us alone upstairs, we would have slept Neither through the storm fine. and had a good yeah, night's yeah. sleep. Yes. But by the time Uncle Ralph was finished telling his stories, we were terrified to go back upstairs and go to bed. I was going to go to sleep before we passed Oh, away. yeah, and uh, yeah. holy candles. If you yeah. didn't want the lightning to hit your house, <laughs> put a holy <laughs> candle in the night. window. Yeah, was when he Because she always took the night shifts. That was the only time that we, some of us, had to take the night shift for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, was when he died. Mm -hmm. But I, but the story, I mean, I just remember those stories, and I know that some of them, you know, had been handed down for a long time, right? It's, I mean, it's so the Acadians, well known for, for their storytelling. Uh, but in the in the Cutler family, it was all scary stories about the sea. Yeah. You know, it almost made you didn't want to go swimming the next day, right? They, they used to call it a, a place where we uh, we lived it uh, during the at night. Was that appelle petit bout? That was the part of the house that was that was a stove in there. And it was only used really by the immediate family. And also, if somebody died, uh, they okay. would wake them there. You know, and I remember sitting the tapis tracé, you know, when them... Uh, hope rug. Hope rug. Mat, not hope, it was a uh, tracé, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was all braided, around. A braided, a braided, a braided yes. rug where they, they, you'd sit, it would kill the draft from coming up from the, the cellar. Oh, gosh. And uh, my grandfather would tell us stories, and my grandmother would step in because she believed a lot in those avertissements, mm -hmm. uh, forerunners. I was just going to ask yeah, about that. Was yeah. Yeah. Oh, so what's what was so the name in French? Yeah. What's the name? Avertissement. Avertissement. In other words, you you were sent a message that this thing was yeah. going to happen. Yeah. And my grandmother was uh, had these advertisements, so she says. Mm. Uh, she said that her brother Joe Bona was drowned off of uh, Boston on a boat. He fell off or somehow and he drowned. Mm. And she said that night when Joe, she says she remembers very well. That night, his picture that she had on the organ in the living room fell on the ground and it broke. Mm. And then she went to pick up water for, to make tea, and the water was shaking like something was shaking the buckets. Wow. And it was spilling over. And she said, you know, six weeks after, they got news from Boston that he had drowned mm. on this particular day. Mm -hmm. yeah, my no, I, I believe in that. My, my grandmother used to do that too because yeah, uh, too. most my of her brothers, had, yeah, most yeah, of her brothers was. all died of a massive heart attack, mm -hmm. and she used to tell my mom something happened in my family because she said this morning there's a bird that hit the window. Yeah, you yeah. know those. Yeah, yeah, I remember there's those. A, yeah. There's yeah. a bird that hit the window this morning, so somebody something happened in my family, and sure enough, somebody would be coming over and saying one of her brothers had passed yes. away. Has anybody here ever seen a ghost? I never have. I have. I haven't ever seen them, but I've heard them and I've smelled them. Well, I've seen my father. Yeah, I've, I've smelled Well, there's supposed to be one in my house, but I... He must be nice. Him? He must be awfully nice. I don't know. <laughs> I can tell you why you don't, you don't notice it, because he's a romantic. He's a romantic. I've done a reading at your, at your Okay, house. a romantic. Yeah, when the, when the, when the, the planes were there. Yeah. Before they sold the place. Yeah. Huh. He's a romantic. I did a reading. So, so why a, doesn't he romanticize her? Yeah. Why? How come there's no romance? Yeah. He's very, he's very quiet. And there's one of the bedrooms upstairs that he's more connected to than the other for whatever reason. I don't oh, know. Okay. 
Okay, well maybe yeah. it's the young John Thomas and, and Balain who and built my house. You know the house? part of your house where there's that peak? Yep. There's something in the wall there. Okay. But I don't know what it is. There's just something there. Yeah. Oh, well, if I was I you, I'd tear that wall down. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't and see something it. Something fell. Something fell. Yeah. There was a man there. He was writing. Okay. And and uh, there was like an opening or something. I think it was a shoot at one time. I don't know. Could have been. But he dropped something. Hmm. The walls are all hollow. It's very easy to drop yeah. things. Yeah. I don't think it's any of any significance. It's just something that just flashed. Yeah. Just a flash. Well, people have During claimed to see a ghost in my house. Yeah. But yeah. and they uh, the claim is often made that it is my my uncle Ralph. Um but he'd well, be very that's quiet. Why he's so quiet. That's why he's Was quiet. he romantic? But he yeah. never said enough to know. I mean, yeah. He's a pretty know. quiet man. He, he wasn't married. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it's, it, 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 I believe that there are ghosts. Because uh, our daughter married uh, and they moved into a, a house that belonged to his grandparents. A lot of people had been waked in this particular house. Mm. But what had happened is that his aunts, uh, he, his, his father only had two siblings, two girls. And both of them were killed on Mother's Day at the mm. same time by a drunk driver. Anyway, so the, the top part of this house had never been used. So when our daughter moved into that house, she went upstairs and she said, Mom, the curtains were the same. Like 25 years after, nothing had ever been changed. So she cleaned up the rooms and made them, you know, so nice so that when we went to visit, we'd stay up there. So the first time we were there, I got up and went to the washroom and I washed my hair and I'm sitting on the edge of the bed and as I'm drying my hair, all of a sudden I feel, mm. and I said, oh my God, there's like somebody. Wind? Yes. Like wind? Yes. Oh. I said, oh my God, there's somebody here with me. So and I, just but I couldn't it. find anybody. But it was, it, it, I, did, I wasn't scared. I, I just felt that there was somebody yeah. watching me. Hmm. And they felt, I felt like somebody was looking and saying, oh, you know, admiring. Yes. M you know, because they were probably be my age, you know, like <laughs> yeah, if yeah. they had been living. Huh. Yeah. So, the, the, and I'm saying, oh my gosh, I don't know if I want to be here. But see, all their <laughs> stuff was there, all their suitcases and most of their clothes had stayed because right. the mother never went upstairs after they were killed. Wow. Ever. Okay. Ever. Wow. So I think because when I spoke to uh, my daughter's mother-in-law at the time, she said, you know, it's possible. Because she said there, there was never any closure. Mm. No. Because uh, the mother never went upstairs after that. Mm. But I said it was just, but I would never go back upstairs by myself. No. <laughs> I insisted that, I said to my husband, I'm going to go up into that bedroom, but I'm not going up there before you're coming up there with me. Uh. But he, he did too. He felt the same presence. He felt it. He yeah. felt it too. He said, I'm sure, he said, there's, you know, hmm. there's some, there, there's some presence there. Yeah. Mm. It wasn't menacing. It was mm -hmm. just like a, admiring, yeah. you know, like, mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe they were just glad that somebody was finally in that room. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. My husband was around for a while after he passed away. He was a smoker, so he loved his cigarettes, and he ended up getting smoke, uh, cancer in his mouth, which was from smoking and mm. what have you. Anyway, um, after he passed, I remember sitting in the living room and I'd smell smoke and I'd go out, get up and I'd look everywhere to see if I could find the smoke, like where, where, where was it coming from? But nobody ever smelled it but me. So uh, one, I had a, one, I do readings, I, I do psychic readings, and uh, one of my regulars came one day and she was very into this. And she said, so are you smelling smoke yet? And I said, oh, Yes, of course I am. Just never connected it to myself, to him, you know. And I said, yeah, I do. And she said, well, you know, that's your husband. And I said, yeah, I know, yeah, I, I know now what you're saying, yeah. So anyway, uh, it kept happening. So one evening I said, okay, Johnny, if that's you, I don't want to smell the smoke anymore. I didn't like it when you were alive. I don't like it now. <laughs> it was so strong, it was burning my nose and burning my throat. Huh. That's how wow. strong the smell was, but nobody else smelled it. And I said, you can only do it when it's something special. So I didn't smell smoke for a long time. Then when my son was living in Florida at the time, they just had a new, a new little girl. And we, I went to Florida, and we were all sitting in the living room admiring the new baby and everything. And all of a sudden, I smelled smoke, and I said, Huh. You guys smelling smoke? And my son gets up and he's looking all over the place and he opens the doors and he said, no, mom, there's no, what's going on? And I said, it's okay. We used to call him Pop. He wasn't great. Grandpa, he was Pop. I said, it's just Pop 
letting us know he knows Callie's here because Callie was the new granddaughter. And I haven't smelled it smith since. Mm -hmm. I have not smelled smoke since. Wow. Yeah, nice. And I, I knew it was him. I knew wow. it was him. I'm sitting in the living room just around that time, and we had got these get well, uh, not get well, uh, condolences. And it was right by the, the fire, little fireplace that we had there. And it was perfectly still. So I'm feeling kind of brave as me. I don't want to see ghosts. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, Johnny, I said, if that's you, I said, move, move, the, move the, the balloon. So I'm looking intently at the balloon, and all of a sudden, the balloon goes like this and starts to move, I swear. <laughs> starts to move, and I was like, oh, okay. Uh, okay, now you can stop it now. But it never it didn't stop until I left the room. <laughs> I, I'd had enough. Well, I think we could probably so. wind up pretty soon. Um, I'm just curious as to whether there's a story or a recollection or something that you wanted to... I saw my father. He died when I was four years old. And I saw him, I'd get up in the middle of the night to go to the washroom and he was sitting in a chair, his leg cross, bare feet, in a suit, having a cigarette with a smile on his face. Huh. And I'm the only one who ever saw him. Hmm. And I saw him for eight years, the whole eight years that we stayed in that apartment. And when my mother bought the house, I saw him one more time. And that's the only time he was standing and he was standing at the foot of my bed and he just went, hmm. and that was the last time I saw him. That's actually quite wow. lovely. Yeah, that yeah. is yeah. nice. And yeah. I, I, I know it's true because when I had mentioned to my mother that he was bare feet, she says he was bare feet in the coffin. Hmm. So, hmm. And I didn't know that. I was only four. Right. My, my niece will not stay at my mother's house in Petrigro because she says it's, there's a ghost there. Yeah. And she said she saw him. It was a, about a six-year-old boy that stood in the back of the, when she was in the bed. The, the, the little fella climbed on the bed, and he had these overalls, you know, with the bib, mm -hmm. tied, and, and a, sh a shirt, and uh, she had a pair of boots on, and she swears, and she just, she just sat there on the side of the bed. Hmm. And years ago, old Jimmy Bob, my grandfather's brother, about that age, drowned at the wharf below the below the uh, below the house, hmm. and you wonder if it's not him. Coming, yeah, <laughs> coming for a visit. His name was Daniel after the singer. There. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this was else? fun. I used it to. Fun, I yeah. used to. Uh, uh, premonitions. Yeah. Well, I used to. Uh, I used to dream about having a baby in my arms. The baby, I, did, I couldn't, I, I can't tell you if it's a boy or a girl. Mm. It was a little baby, and I'd rock the baby all night long. But when I get up in the morning, somebody in my family will have died. Oh. And mm. it went on for years, and I used to dread that dream, because every morning when I'd get up, there'd be something. remember one time I dreamt about this baby, and um, my mom called, and mom said, I have something to tell you. I said, yeah, Aunt Eva passed away, and she says, you're a witch. Oh. But I knew something, you yeah. know, something had happened. And uh, the dream stopped when I started telling my husband about the dream. Hmm. I told him one day because it, it bothered me really yes. a lot. Mm -hmm. So I told him what was going on. He said, and so of course, what did he tell him? He looked at me and he says, must have been a very good baby because I didn't hear it all night. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's very <laughs> You know him. so He's right? a comedian. <laughs> he really is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very normal for people to dream of their insecurities, you know, what they're afraid of, you know, or, uh, you know, some people will, will dream a lot about being in a situation where uh, oh, they're always me. lost or they, they feel that they're behind the eight ball. Oh, yeah. You know? I, well, I never, I never, I always have good dreams. Like, I know? always have happy dreams. I never dream yeah. like uh, somebody's chasing me or stuff like that. But it was just this... You know, because I'm a good sleeper. I just sleep. <laughs> yeah. I used to just get feelings when I was a kid. I always knew something coming. Was, was I used to dread something that was coming. And then when something not too pleasant or bad would happen, then I'd say, it would leave me, and I'd be okay. Yeah. I'd be okay See, after we, that. In our family, we had a lot of debts. And, uh, I went to school. I went to the university five years, and I wrote final exams twice. Three times I had to come home for Debt, 
Mm. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. I fathered round. My best friend died uh, the same day, uh, the same uh, the year after. Oh man. Died of cancer, a Wayne, yeah. Wayne Abel. And uh, you know there was always something going on. My grandmother dropped dead, walking to church with her, going to church at Belle Grand, oh, on, on the first Friday of the month in November. Hmm. Massive heart attack. Hmm. Right, right next where the Brochette used to live. That's yeah, where yeah, she. Yeah. And it was Black Roy there from down the, uh, and pick, the picked her up. Well, my grandmother always had premonitions, and and um, she became sort of self conscious about them, and I'm not, I'm not really sure why, but I remember on a number of occasions, you know, we were living in Montreal. My my grandmother was in, in Nova Scotia, but something would happen, and you know, my mother would phone her parents, and uh, the conversation kind of always, well, so did did, did mom have a dream? She would and and, and she'd have him in a dream. The premonitions. She, she yeah, mm -hmm. often a dream. Yeah, and babies were always a yeah, sign of death. Yeah, I um, always had that. But when I and then yeah. I would talk to the priest, our parish priest at the time, Father Yui, you could tell him just about anything, you know. Yeah. And uh, he said, you know, people that, that they have special. You have you're something. It's intuition. There's I call like it. it's like a special something. Yeah. yeah, it's a special something. Anyway. Yeah. I said, well, I didn't feel very special because you know, then I I, I dread the next day. Like yeah, because you felt you had I that message. I felt that there was something. And yeah, my grandmother didn't like having them. No, no, no. no. A yeah. few times I saw, let's say that I would meet you, and I would see like makeup on your face, like death makeup, and the person would die shortly after. That wow. happened to me a few times. Okay, you'll let me know, right? <laughs> no, uh, no makeup whatsoever. No. And, and it struck me funny. Like, and the one time I even said it out loud, is that person's going to die. Huh. And they did. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. You're, you're, you're bound to be right one day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah that's true. We're all going I to see die. makeup on you. you know? <laughs> Sooner or later. We're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, on that note, I want to say that this is, I've found this really pleasant. And uh, it's been a privilege to well, sit thank you and, for and you chat having with you. I've learned thank a few you. things. Lunch and, uh, was delicious. Yeah. Yeah. Compliments, yeah. To nice. Compliments, Compliments to the chef. Compliments to the chef. We will let her know. We will let her know. Yes. It was very pleasant. Thanks. No, this was nice, and it was nice meeting you. Yes, You're nice the only one that I had not met before. Right. So uh, now I can put a face on the writer. Yes, now you can put a face on the writer.